Okay, so I'm recording now. All right, we're good. Um, but there's no, oh, here it is, it's coming up. Okay, and I need to make it full, full screen. Um, so if I want to make it full screen, I, okay, here we go. Oh, that's fine. So, um, yeah, so, so for example, I would see a patient one month, and then three months later, their family would bring them back in a wheelchair. And I would be astonished by this because they had, were walking three months earlier, and they would say, oh, of course, this is just to be expected. And I would say, no, no, this is not to be expected that someone should lose their mobility in such a short period of time. Um, and But I didn't really have a lot of information to help guide our discussions around this. And again, so it, it, this, this idea of what is normal in dementia in terms of changes in mobility and what are the various contributors that may accelerate changes over time. And so that's part, where part of my research is. So I'm, my focus today is, how do I make it, skip slides? Next slide, okay. First, I'll give you my disclosures, which is that I don't have any special commercial interests. I'm not funded by any pharmaceutical com companies or anything like that. So. So I'm going to take you through a talk that's about falls in advanced dementia. And I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we have in making falls risk assessments in this population. And I'm going to talk to you about some research we're doing in this area, so a project called Ambient. And then I'm going to talk about, go on, like once you've made your falls risk assessment, what do we do in terms of preventing falls? And how is this different in sort of than the general adult population? And I'm going to specifically get to a bit of a philosophical discussion around how we balance our perspectives towards safety and then allowing people freedom of action. Um, because a lot of false prevention interventions inadvertently result in limiting people's mobility. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about how um, we are starting to see things more from a person-centered, stage-specific approach to falls rather than purely falls prevention, and talk a little bit about a project that we have in that area. So to start off with, talking about mobility and falls risk, the first thing I want to do is sort of define my terms. I'm talking here about advanced dementia, and not everybody necessarily knows what advanced dementia means. So in this context, I'm talking about people who have moderately severe to severe dementia. So these are people who are at fast stage six or seven. Fasting, fast is a, a sort of a tool we use to stage dementia. So these are people who actually need assistance with their activities of daily living. They need help with their bathing or toileting, dressing, um, or they are even progress even further than that where they're at the place, stage where they've completely lost their independence in this area, that they're um, dependent um, in terms of their continence, and they um, may be starting to lose their speech and may be at the stage where they're starting to lose also their ability to walk, mobilize independently. So this is the advanced dementia population. A lot of people who are at this stage of their disease are living in residential facilities like long-term care or they're at home with a very in a very supportive sort of home environment and so what we know is that dementia is a disease that affects the brain and, and what people often think about the cognitive functions that it impacts but because it's a degenerative disease of the brain it affects all kinds of nervous functions including the ability to mobilize and so this is a, a chart that shows um, it was a study of like 800 people who at the baseline at the, the first time zero um, were, were um, not, did not have dementia and were, were mobile. And they followed them over 10 years. And those people who go on to develop dementia, whether it's Alzheimer's or another dementia, um, had a more rapid um, decline in their mobility. To, and about over a 10-year period, this is a, at a point where they're quite um, dependent in terms of their mobility. So, so this is a, um, a sort of typical course of mobility decline in dementia, from sort of cognitively normal to dementia. Sure. A little bit more quickly, yeah, exactly, yeah. So those tend to cause um, different damage in the particular regions of the brain that are more like or Lewy body dementia, or Parkinson's dementia. Those are all much more associated with mobility issues than Alzheimer's, but they all are. So the kinds of things that we see that develop slowly over time is at the very beginning, it's uh, simply a slowing of, of walking. You know, people aren't able to move as quickly. And then there's uh, a change in terms of their ability to, to um, execute the more complex functions, um, we call executive function, which is being able to sort of do two things at once in this case. Um, so people who walk and then they have to stop walking to talk because they can't walk and talk at the same time. Their gait variability becomes higher so that there's less of a rhythmic sort of pattern to their walking. Their postural stability is impacted so that they aren't able to maintain their posture as easily. If you sort of throw them a little bit off balance, they can't necessarily catch themselves. And then they, people can actually develop frank movement disorders, things such as Parkinson's disease. 
So um, this change in mobility contributes to an increased risk of falls in this population. And so people at this stage of their dementia are at the highest risk compared to any other stage. And basically almost all of them will fall um, at least once a year. So it's a 60 to 80 percent risk of falling in this population. And if you take all, all of the residents of residential, residential care facilities, there's an average of 1.4 falls per person per year. So that includes people who are actually like bed bound or wheelchair bound. So, you know, if you, in also people who are actually physically quite well. And so there's actually, when you look at the total population, there's usually a, a smaller proportion of people who are ambulatory, who are unsteady and who fall a lot. So fall more than once a year. Um, you know, in Lewy body dementia, they say that they may fall as much as 10 times a year on average. And so um, we know that falls are the, the main cause of deaths in residential care with external causes. So 90% of deaths in that setting are due to external deaths. So not people not dying from their own medical illnesses, for example. And it's the leading cause of hospital admission. And people with dementia who fall um, compared to someone who doesn't have dementia are at three times greater risk of having a hip fracture. And the risk after you have a hip fracture, if you're at this stage of your disease, is that you die, 50% will die within six months. So hip fracture is a very negative event in this population in terms of their mortality. So some of the complication around assessing um, dementia risk factors in this population um, is that there are more than just the physical risk factors. So older adults who, um, who are cognitively intact and who are moving around their environment, largely their, their falls risk factors come down to their strength, their balance, those kinds of physical issues. Um, and people with dementia, there are these additional categories, so cognitive issues. So that might be, for example, they have disturbances in their visual spatial function, such that they have trouble interpreting their environment. They can't see obstacles. They can't tell where the chair is. And so when they go to sit down, they, they miss the chair. Um, they may have difficulties with motor planning, so being able to... Um, um, like sequence their, 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 you know, if they want to stand up, but they kind of get the sequence of movements wrong, and that makes means that they fall. They, their language is impaired, so they may not be able to articulate a need that they have, and so even though they know that they're unsteady, they, they get up to go and try to satisfy this need. They probably have problems with memory, so they can't remember to use their walker. You know, they may have um, problems with memory such that they, you know, don't know their environment. They can't find where they're heading, and so they can't find the chair, and they, they collapse. So the, th those are cognitive related issues that may contribute to falls. And then there are this whole category of behavioral issues, which is where I come in as a psychiatrist and where a lot of my interest lies, which is that there's people who have dementia they sometimes exhibit patterns of behaviors that put them at higher risk. They may not have insight into their limitations. So if you, for example, have a broken leg, you know not to stand on it. Um, they may not understand that it's not safe for them to stand. So they, they can't remember that piece of information. Their judgment may be impaired. They may climb on tables, on chairs. Um, they uh, may be impulsive so that they act quickly. They don't take a moment to think their actions through. Um, they may be hallucinating so that they're, they're bending down to pick things off the ground that are not there and then all that bending and puts them at risk. They may have a degree of, of aggression or agitation that throws them off balance um, and, and patterns of wandering or seeking behaviors where they're going round and round in circles where they can exhaust themselves and, um, and be at risk of falling. So all of these behavioral risks are all related um, intrinsically to the sort of the changes that happen in dementia. And so what we see over time as people progress through their illness is that a lot of risk factors that we traditionally consider modifiable or as targets for falls prevention types interventions actually become less modifiable over time. So there still are some modifiable fire falls risks in, in dementia, and these can't, they really, you really do have to pay attention to these. Things like medication use, inappropriate footwear, environmental hazards, lighting, those sorts of things. Um, but things like um, muscle weakness and gait get and balance problems, these become more challenging um, as uh, – there's no – oh, there's no animations on these screens. That's fine. Okay. Uh, as, so they kind of moves over to the other side <laughs> as, um, as people um, – um, are, aren't able to engage in rehabilitation kind of pro programs as they once were able to do. They aren't able to regain continence, for example. And, and so um, they, they move into this category of just sort of factors that you have to adapt to and, and deal with that you can't change. So the other thing I showed you earlier had this kind of nice straight line that people decline with mobility over time. But the reality is that people don't progress in a straight line. There's a lot of variability that there are accelerations and then stabilizations, maybe even improvements. And, and um, what's 
one thing that we, we aren't very good at is actually detecting those. Like I said, people turn up in my office and they stop walking and it's almost like it happens without, without anyone taking alarm to it sometimes. And the same thing in nursing settings, that people are changing, there's like hundreds of residents in these places and people don't necessarily aren't aware of the status of everyone at every time. So this is where um, one of the projects, um, so, so, so one of the things that we have identified as a problem is that the tools that we use to sort of track mobility and falls risks are actually not that helpful in people with dementia. So first off, a lot of them are performance-based, where we say walk from here to there as fast as you can. But if someone can't follow those instructions or don't have the motivation to be able to do that, then it's not a valid tool. And that the a lot of these tools are designed for rehab settings, you know, where the expectation is that people will get better. And they are really focused on physical performance. And we know that more than physical performance is involved in this case. And the other problem is that this population that I'm talking about, by almost uniformly, by all of these tools, are identified as high falls risk. So they don't actually provide us with very much information. I can tell you that all these people are at high falls risk. And they are validated over these long periods of time. So they say, yes, these people are at high falls risk. They're going to fall this year. But you know, again, that's not information. I know these people are probably going to fall this year. But is it going to happen this week or in two months? And then they're often completed. Um, at very fixed points, you know, at, at visits to the geriatrician or um, at admission to the long-term care facility. And so you don't really get this sense of change over time. You don't can't identify these accelerations and decline. So this is um, the problem that we identify, the need for a responsive and dynamic falls risk assessment tool. And this is a, one of our projects, which is called Ambient. And so Ambient is using this um, inexpensive computer vision technology, which is basically the Kinect sensor, to monitor people as they move around in their environment. And from that, to be able to capture information about how they're moving. And the aim is then to collect many observations over on a, like a nearly daily basis over a long period of time so that we can really detect changes that are predictive of either falls or some kind of decline in their physical status that we need to be aware of. And that, that gives us then that opportunity for intervention to understand what the triggers are. Um, and so this is the, I'll quickly show you the video, but um, so this is for the people on the, who are not here. There's a, a link to the video in the chat room section, so you can go there. And I'm gonna just jump ahead actually a bit because this is a lot of, oh, and there's music. I don't know if I, <laughs> give me a second. I'm just gonna see if I can mute it. Uh, da, 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 da. The music's fine. Do you guys don't mind the cheesy music? No, I'll turn it in. Okay. So um, this is um, the system. It's a Kinect camera. And we use these tags that we iron onto people's pants. And we have these antennas that, that pick up the tags as people move past the camera. And then there's a computer on the wall, because it's all run by a computer. And so the idea is that as people um, move through their environment, the tag is picked up by the antenna. It signals the camera to turn on. The camera captures a walking sequence. Um, and then from the walking sequence, we can extract these mobility parameters. So here's our, our very slow moving postdoc, um, who, um, it, with one thing we discovered is that people move slowly, which is good because it means we can capture more data. But this is what it looks like. So they're, they develop this sort of skeleton that tracks their body. Um, and um, and then we, from that information, we can collect multiple episodes of walking a day. I'll go back to my presentation. So, so we've had this installed on our dementia inpatient unit at Toronto Rehab for six months. Um, and we've so far had 20 participants. One of the limitations of our setting is that we have very short stays and we don't have a lot of beds. And so it's hard to get a lot of numbers. But um, so we've got 20 people so far. And the eight of those people have fallen. Um, and so many of them multiple times. So a total of 14 falls. And so over that period, we were able to collect, on average, 51 walking sequences per person and over about a 46-day length of stay. So on average, about one walking sequence per day over their stay. And then from that, we get this information, their step time, their step length, the cadence, the asymmetry of their walking, the step length asymmetry. We also can measure their trunk, how much their trunk is moving, how much they're swaying around as they move, and with something called the tortuosity, which is like how much they're kind of weaving as they walk. Um, and so, um, and so this is this is where we're at right now. And the idea is that we're gonna they're using these machine learning algorithms to collect all this data, and then correlate it to events like falls or correlate it to decline, starting new medications, etc., so that we can end up with this sort of predictive models that can be used in clinical care. So that's this is a sort of initial pilot study. That's where we're at. 
but leaves the question, so so what? So we, we developed this amazing system that tells us that somebody's walking has changed. And you know, so what are we going to do to prevent a fall? What do we know about what works in this population? And unfortunately, the answer is that we don't know a lot. There isn't a lot of very good evidence in this population. There have been a number of falls prevention interventions that have been developed for cognitively normal older adults. Um, but when they've tested them in people with dementia, they don't work. They don't seem to be feasible in this population. Um, and that most, the most effective interventions, the ones that have been shown to work in this population, they're actually quite resource intensive. They're difficult to implement. Um, and so I'll talk about what those are in a minute. And a lot of these studies are really, even though like the, the studies that show some weak benefit for them, they're, they're very, they often lack control groups. And one of the things that we discovered on our unit is that the falls come in waves. For some reason, they like they come and go, you know. And you, if you follow a group over, you know, three months, you might find that they don't fall very much. But in the context of a study, if it's not, you know, randomized and controlled, it could just be that everyone's really hyper aware of falls those three months because you're doing this intervention in this study. So we, we implemented this tool on our unit, and it was amazing. For the first three months, hardly anyone followed, and I, I was like, "This is not this is not real, right?" It's you know, and it, and it's not because then the next three months everybody fell, and so you know, it's it's really about making sure that these studies have the quality of evidence that we need to support these interventions. And at the moment, there there are very few that have that sort of quality of evidence. There's something called enhanced supervision, which is um, the idea being that you really need somebody whose job it is to help focus on preventing falls in those people who you identify who are at immediately the highest risk. So again, not the whole nursing home population, but maybe like 10 people who really need that extra bit of help. And so what this person does is they check the rooms every hour. It's hourly rounding on those 10 people. And they administer group activities for those 10 people. They address their toileting needs. So they get toileted every hour, every two hours. They get assisted with transfers. They get taken on supervised walks you know, to help you know, tire them out. So they get their exercise, and then they can settle down. Um, and then it's constantly scanning the environment for these patients, making sure the environment is safe. And this, this decreases the falls in this population. Dementia care mapping is a sort of similar idea along these lines. It's a kind of approach that's about an application of person-centered care where you really try to understand the person and what helps and doesn't help them and then develop a care plan. And, and that seems to decrease falls. Changing the environment, like building a wander garden helps. And again, hourly rounding is another approach that seems to help. But there's no evidence for exercise programs in this population, no um, evidence for these multifactorial interventions. Although like, there have been a few small positive trials, um, but when you look at the bigger randomized controlled trials, those have all been negative. Um, importantly, restraint use has definitely been shown not to prevent falls. Like they're one of those interventions that prevents falls this moment, right? They're not going to fall because they're tied down in this second. Um, but in the longer term, in the bigger picture, people who are restrained fall more and have more severe injuries. So it's not an intervention that actually helps in the long term. Bed and chair alarms are very popular, but they also have never been shown in a randomized controlled way to prevent falls. And the one trial that was randomized controlled, which is this one, showed that they were not effective. So medications, I just to give that proviso that, that some people sometimes ask me, can you please medicate this person so that they don't fall? That does not help, except in the very rare instance where someone has a severe psychosis or agitation related to their dementia, treating that will decrease their falls. But outside of that scenario, no, it doesn't decrease falls. So this is the, you know, um, the current sort of falls prevention algorithm that was developed by Safer Healthcare Now, which is, it's, you know, it's a really outstanding sort of kit that takes people through all these steps about how to have a sort of safer environment, how to develop a falls care plans for people. Um, but the, the problem is that it's very heavily reliant on all of these interventions that have real no, really no evidence base. And they be it becomes a, a conversation um, that has some unintended consequences when there is such a strong focus on falls prevention. Um, often mobility and and um, freedom <laughs> become compromised. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I circled this here because the pro often I find that even though like this is a multi-step process, that people get bogged down in the first few steps where they're just assessing the risk. And then maybe a little bit of communicating the risk, like they tell people, yeah, this person's a really high follower's risk. But the more complicated and difficult part is actually coming up with the care plan in conjunction with the family. And that's the part that's often missing. And, and so I think the problem is that we, so I'm not saying that false prevention is a bad thing. I think it's good. It's just that it's it's hard to really implement it in its full extent in such a way that is um, helpful. And so um, what's happened in 
not only our province, our country, but our whole continent, is that falls are being recognized now as a quality indicator. And so the assumption behind this is that falls occur because there's some kind of lapse in care and that they can be prevented if our care was just better, right? So that's, you know, let's measure falls because that will tell us something about the quality of care that's happening in this setting. And so, so since 1995, every nursing home and every hospital um, in the province has been reporting their falls rates to the to the government and they keep track of this as a quality indicator and I don't know if you guys know this but you can go onto the internet this um, your health system .ca or something it's a, it's a web page run by Kai Hai C I H I and you can look up like how many people fall in the nursing home that your mother is in or your you know that that's down the road from you and you can look up how much restraints are used you know, all of this data is actually publicly available now and so there's this kind of underlying belief behind this, which is that falls should not occur, right? Falls should be preventable. And that this creates an incredibly strong disincentive for facilities, for institutions, for individuals like nursing staff to not let patients move. Because if they move, they might fall. <laughs> and so um, this is a problem that we have. And, and like I was saying, this is not just in our provinces across North America, that in the United States, they are now, they call falls never events that this is, should never happen. And this led to some over-implementation of measures with little efficacy for falls, yet a profound effect on people's immobility. Um, and so I'm gonna, I'll just show you a, a slide about how little impact <laughs> falls at prevention interventions have had. So this is, so we've been publicly reporting falls rates since 2010. Um, and so this is the data that's easily available. And you can, and falls prevention interventions have been a really a huge investment in resources across our whole system since about, like between 2005 and 2013 was the real push. And you can see that really there has been no change in falls rates, and these are long-term care across Canada, Toronto, Ontario. Um, this is, you know, this is, this is important important. This is the a huge financial disincentive in the, in the United States. Medicare stopped covering costs associated with falls-related injuries in hospitals. So if someone had a fall and broke a hip, they would say the hospital had to pay for that. It would come out of their budget. And this was they did this with some other indicators too. So they did it with um, catheter-associated infections. So this is the one down here, D. When they put in this policy, catheter-related infections decreased actually so you know nurses were more careful when they put in the catheters when they did it with um, central line associated infections that also significantly decreased but it had absolutely no impact on the falls no impact at all it also interestingly had no impact on pressure ulcers so there are some things that are preventable some healthcare outcomes that are clearly preventable and infections seem to be one of them but falls are not clearly preventable and so the concern we have is that there are a lot of unintended consequences of an, a focus that's uniquely false prevention. Again, I'm not saying we don't do false prevention. False prevention has a role, but that you can't uniquely focus on false prevention because that just creates a culture of blame, of fear, of guilt. I mean, nobody wants their patient to fall and get hurt. And, and so people become very protective. They also, it, this creates all of these administrative barriers. So if a nurse has a patient fall on their shift, then all of a sudden that's like half an hour of documenting that they have to do around that falls event. That means it takes them away from their other patients and the other care duties. And so really, really strongly, a strong disincentive to let, you know, let their patients move around. And so it leads to various forms of restraint use. And when we think about restraint use, we think about like people being tied down, but there's all different ways that people get restrained. They get put in a wheelchair and then wheeled right up to a table and their wheelchair locked. You know, they can't get out. They're effectively restrained, but they're not, you know, they're not tied down in the way we typically think about it. So people get restrained in all different kinds of ways. But the outcome is that they're not moving as much. And when patients are immobile, they lose function. And that we know that when patients lose function, that ultimately when they do fall, that fall is going to be more injurious, right? So if, if people are able to catch their balance somewhat, they fall. You know, but if they really lose the ability to maintain their stability, they fall in a much more dangerous way. So... We are at this picture of how do we balance safety in our pop, in our patients. We, we want to keep them safe, there's no question. But we also want to provide them freedom to move around and that ultimately that freedom we think might contribute to their safety. And, and it becomes a discussion often in this population that we have with the caregivers, like the family members, because you can't necessarily have this conversation with the patient. They can't necessarily express their wishes around this. They won't say, I know that I'm at risk for falling and I'd, I'd rather walk than be restrained. Like you, it's not 
the insight isn't there, and so you can't have this conversation. So how do we have these discussions with family members? And I don't know if you can read this. I, I did this poll recently at a conference I went to, and it was kind of a, it was interesting because it was a perfect example of, um, you know, when people are in their best behavior when they fill out polls, they don't want to, you know. So we, I was asking healthcare workers essentially, um, what would you do if you had a, a, a physical li limitation, and what would you do in terms of your, how much you would restrict yourself, and then how much would you restrict your mother if she had a physical limitation and was at risk for falling, and and I actually found there was very little difference between what they said they would do for themselves and their mother, um, which we know is actually probably in reality not quite true that people do make decisions for themselves. They allow themselves more autonomy than they give others. But this is what we found. And I, but I gave them a very small risk of injury. I said that if, you're, if they're, they're falling every, mo every month and we think that in the next year they have about a 30% risk of injury. It was a very conservative. So if you have someone who's falling once a month and the risk of an injury is about one in five, actually the risk over a year is probably closer to 80% that they're going to have a serious injury in that year. So I underestimated the risk for that part. So the choices were to um, just let them walk. You know, I'll, I'll walk. I don't, I'm not worried about being injured. And the second one was I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restrict my activities. I'm not going to move as much. Or let's restrict the amount that they're walking. And then the last one here is restrain them. Don't let them walk. Or I'm going to stop walking. So you can see very few people choose like the most extreme version. And then um, the, and the next question that we asked was like how high would this risk need to be before you would take the next option, like before you would actually decide to restrain someone more. Um, and then again, for people, so people were concerned, they, they were like, well, if I knew for certain that I was going to get hurt, then I actually think that 21% said they would take a more restrictive approach to themselves. Um, but and there was a big difference here was that there was this whole cohort of people in the group who said under no circumstances would they restrain the person with dementia, even if the risk was was quite high. So so 33% said that the higher higher levels of restraint would not be acceptable, which is I think that which is a very interesting thing because it also then it suggests that we're not so good at even transitioning people into loss of mobility because some people are going to lose their mobility and so they may need help transitioning to that phase. Um, and that, um, and then I think it's probably not a fair reflection of what the actual practice is. But yeah. Uh, are you tracking at all indoor falling versus outdoor falling? Or are we only talking about an indoor population? Most of this is an indoor population. I mean, they could fall if they were taken by a family. But we, 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 I think most of this is talking about falling in their, in their environments, yeah. So, so um, this is a kind of building to this idea that we need an approach for this population to falls that's a little bit different than the approach that we would use in someone who is able to make these decisions for themselves, right? Who are, is able to communicate, like, I know my falls risk, I understand my risk, and I'm willing to accept this risk. And, and so how do, we, and how, do we, how do we make decisions around um, helping people, how to, preventing falls, maintaining mobility, et cetera? And so... Um, so the approach that we're talking about is a palliative approach. And, and some people have also called this like a person-centered approach. But the idea is basically that at this stage of, of life, that the focus really should be quality of life, uh, an improving quality of life, rather than a, like a, a total focus on preventing harm. And that it is through trying to prevent relief, uh, prevent and relief suffering, um, but that's through not through, again, um, um, activities that restrict quality of life, but through assessment and treatment of pain and other problems, physical, psychosocial, and, and spiritual. And so um, what we are advocating is that falls in this population may in fact be an indicator that people are having some palliative care needs. Um, so, so that especially when the falls are very are recurrent or severe. So, you know, a single fall in somebody, you know, may just be a sign that they tripped. But if they're falling on a regular basis and these falls are associated with injuries, then really there, there's, there's some kind of message there. And usually, um, these injuries can be sentinel events, like a sign that they're having some kind of physical decline that may be approaching the end of their life, um, or they may simply be um, at such a high risk for injury, like the falls that they're having, like they're not guarding themselves, they're smacking their head every time, that we know that something serious is coming, and that there's really high levels of either staff or family distress around these falls. It's, it's really time to think about this um, from a more holistic perspective and uh, bring in some of these palliative care um, approaches. And so, and of course, it's not falls in and of themselves. It's also falls in combination with other palliative care indicators. So people who are approaching, people, dementia is a is a chronic and life limiting illness, and it, it is an illness that, especially in the later stages, um, really benefits from a more palliative approach. 
So I'm going to give a, a case example. Um, uh, I'm looking at the time. I think I have time for a case example. So, so this is um, a 69-year-old man who came to our inpatient unit, and he had a 25-year history of Parkinson's disease. And five years, the last five years, was uh, he developed Parkinson's dementia. And so he was admitted to our unit, and he came from a nursing home where he was incredibly restless, impulsive. He was running and climbing on the furniture. Um, he was falling every day, sometimes multiple times. He was going out to hospital. He was covered in bruises and scratches. Um, they had a helmet on him because they were so worried about him. Um, he didn't like the helmet. He tried to take it off. They would sometimes throw him in a wheelchair and put a seat belt on him, but he was so restless that he was sliding down, and so that was a real risk for choking. Um, he, so his restlessness was a symptom of his um, treatment for his Parkinson. So he had what we call um, dyskinesias. His body was kind of writhing. He had dystonias. So his ankles would sort of evert, so he would be actually walking on the outside of his feet rather than on the soles of his feet. And he had psychosis, where he was seeing things and believing he was in danger. He had other indicators that he um, had a palliative care need. So he was having trouble swallowing and was losing weight. So this was someone who came to our unit, and we um, identified immediately that he was having end-of-life issues in a way, that his disease had kind of come to its end, that there was no more active treatment that would help the course of his Parkinson's. And in fact, it was the active treatment of the Parkinson's that was producing these symptoms in him. And so we had this discussion with the family, and we framed the falls from that perspective. Like So from before, the falls were very much framed as a symptom of his disease rather than as a symptom of the failure of the effective treatments for his disease. And they were relieved to have this discussion because he had had this illness for 25 years and they knew that you know it would be a life limiting illness for him and they were waiting for someone to say, we've done all we can, you know, it's come to the end now. Um, and so what we did was we reduced his therapy for Parkinson's because we saw that it was driving his movement and he wasn't actually able to move anymore. He had lost the independent capacity to move. He was only being driven by his medications. And so, um, but we didn't just stop his medications. We, we managed his symptoms. We managed his pain. We managed his anxiety. And he was lost the ability to walk, uh, as we expected, and transitioned into a very comfortable wheelchair and had dramatically improved quality of life. And he actually lived for a full year after this. So it wasn't, you know, there's this idea that you, if you take away active medical treatments, that you're, you're killing someone, right? You know, you can't take away his Parkinson's disease treatment, he'll die. You know, but he lived a much better quality of life. He was able to, you know, sit in peace in his chair and interact with his family, free of all of his psychosis for a full year after that. So, so an example of where falls can serve as this indicator that we need to do with this kind of, and then, so this is another quick case that I wanted to talk about as well about respecting prior wishes. So this was a 78-year-old man who came to our unit. He had end-stage liver disease, um, and he had some encephalopathy. So when your liver fails, your you know it starts to affect your brain. You, you can't think straight. And he, he had dementia as well, and he came to our unit. And he was very agitated and restless, and he was in a wheelchair, but he wouldn't stay in the wheelchair. He would get up and take a few steps and then fall. And he was falling every day and getting injured. And he, um, the, at the nursing home, they said, well, we think that this is um, his liver disease, and we're going to treat him for his liver disease. But he wouldn't take his medications. He refused to drink it. Um, and so they started treating him with enemas. It's, just, it's a way of treating the liver disease. So they were forcing him to receive enemas to treat the liver disease to prevent the falls. That was the kind of the formulation they had come to. And he would be aggressive when they were giving the enemas and hitting staff. He also had other palliative indicators like abdominal pain and confusion and so we decided that when it came to our unit we would have this discussion with the decision maker and we we said well what do you think if he found himself in this situation what would he have wanted um, and she was very clear that he hated doctors <laughs> he hated hospitals he would never it, it would, he would have been horrified at the thought of being forced of having forced medical interventions and um, and he was kind of in his own way showing he was horrified by this right and so we discontinued these active treatments for his liver disease, with knowing that you know that he was probably going to um, die, but um, but that the the sort of the burden in terms of his quality of life of continuing these forced treatments was you know um, inappropriate, and so we managed his symptoms, we managed his pain and his anxiety, and he wasn't agitated anymore, and he wasn't restless, um, and he you know was in and out of consciousness as his liver disease progressed, and um, but he was able to interact with his family and he enjoy meals and listen to music. And he died comfortably about one month later of his liver disease. So, so there's another example of you know we focusing so much on the falls rather than seeing the bigger picture 
Um, and and that, that falls prevention as a sort of um, activity can sometimes do that now, that our, our resources and our attentions are being diverted away from the bigger picture. So the idea behind a palliative approach to falls is that we find a way to foster an organizational culture that allows the discussion of palliative care approaches, that you can bring this up you know, in, the, in your setting without getting shot. Um, we think there are palliative care issues here. And that we find ways of identifying the palliative care issues and needs and that we are able to have that discussion with the decision makers that frames falls as well as all the other things that we've identified in a sort of um, um, palliative way. And then once we ha have um, that approach is sort of validated by the decision maker, then we have to commit, complete a really good palliative care needs assessment and implement a palliative care plan. And so we're, we're in the process of developing some tools that will help to frame falls in this setting and, um, and evaluating whether a, approaching falls in this way actually will improve outcomes. Um, but one of the elements of this overall approach is that we need to find a way to have a more holistic thinking about falls, right? So how do we get out of this sort of narrow falls prevention focus um, and think about mobility and falls and dementia? And so this is a project that um, I have a postdoc who's working on, which is developing a staging tool. And so the staging tool, the primary real interest is, is developing a tool that facilitates this conversation. You know, what is it that this person would have wanted? Um, where are they in this continuum? Where are they going? Are, are they at a point of transition? And that it, this tool is multidimensional, that it's not just focusing on their abilities. Because you can have someone who walks quite well, but who's falling a lot and is at really high risk because they're doing things like climbing on tables and chairs. So incorporating some of these other elements um, and that is purely observational so that it doesn't require that people perform certain activities to be able to score them, that it provides this staging perspective to track people as they progress and that detects these transitions. Um, and, that, and that when you have this, this framework, that it creates this framework, then you can create um, opportunities for discussion and, op and stage specific interventions, like the idea that at this stage, when somebody is has this impairment and this difficulty, um, these are the kinds of interventions that are appropriate at this stage, right? And so it shifts, it, it really helps with the, with the developing a, a bigger um, sort of tool. So at this point, we're, we've just finished a scoping review um, to help look at the whole area and what the sort of important things that should be form part of this. And we're just about to start um, uh, a modified Delphi um, process where we're getting experts to weigh in about what they think the most important elements are and how they would measure them in this population. Um, and then we're going to, the final step is to do a pilot study of the, of the ultimate tool. And so I'm just, I put this up here because in case there are any people here with expertise in dementia or expertise in falls and are interested in participating in this panel that we are currently recruiting people to be on this panel. So in summary, um, people with advanced dementia will fall um, and that while some of these falls are preventable, not all of the falls are preventable. And it depends a little bit on how many resources we want to put towards preventing falls. If we had, a, every patient had a, a caregiver standing holding their hand, then certainly there would be a lot less falls, but I'm not sure that's a realistic deployment of resources. So, so falls will happen if people move um, and moving is important. Um, so we need to have some kind of stage appropriate preventative interventions and and to sort of consider falls as a symptom that can be managed. So the idea is to not come up with falls prevention plans because the falls prevention plans fail all the time because people fall and then it just becomes a source of failure for a team, right? You come up with falls care plans and when somebody, and, and so then it, you know, it, it, it encompasses not just what happens before a fall but what happens after a fall. You know, what, what is it that we need to do to care effectively for this person? And so then how do we then start moving towards resolving this tension that exists between the safety, um, wanting people to keep people safe, but then allowing them mobility and freedom of action. And so that's the end of my presentation. Thanks. I'm happy to take questions, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when you state that, um, that case where there is no evidence in exercise intervention, it's not in, so much in this the, population. Yeah, it's not so much, so much the population I deal with. Like, still can follow, still can articulate, and have all those Absolutely. more impact on people's daily living. 
Absolutely. I, so there are, you know, there's reasonable, ed, ed, you know, evidence for people who are more cognitively intact or with mild dementia. Right. Yeah. And I think where exercise is feasible, that it should absolutely be used. But I, I don't know if you've ever been to an exercise class in a long-term care facility. There's a very small proportion of residents in that setting who can participate in that kind of activity. And then some people will get one-on-one -on -one physiotherapy to a very limited extent, what's available under our current funding models in our province. So they'll maybe get a physio visiting them for 20 minutes once a week. And then even at a point, they can't even participate in that anymore, you know, because they won't you know, won't, the physio says, let's get up and go for a walk. And they say no. And, you know, so that there's, you know, that there's often a, a limit even to that. Yeah. But I agree. Exercise where possible is an intervention that, that definitely. And, and so I think I, I see exercise as this promoting mobility, right? That, that anything that promotes mobility, in my opinion, is, is reasonable. Yeah. Any other questions? I had we had a really it was a really interesting illustration of this just yesterday on our unit because we had a we have a woman who runs and it freaks everybody out because he starts sprinting down the hallway and she's a frail older woman and um and and they see that as a sign of agitation and for a while they were restraining her when she did this and she hated being restrained she would scream and kick and um, but they saw they were they were protecting her right and we finally came down and we said we're not going to do this anymore we are not going to restrain her let her run we know it's dangerous we spoke to the family we say this is really dangerous we think she might get hurt but this other thing is also really dangerous because it's really distressing to her um, and it's not helping you know it's it's only making things worse um, and so she did have a fall on the weekend and it wasn't she had a little little bump it wasn't a serious injury um, but it was back it was back to that tension again where the staff really felt like but can we restrain her and was it was a she was not restrained for a whole week she did lots of running she fell one time she wasn't injured we're not going to go we're not going to backtrack on this plan you know and so having the having this plan that's really set that involves all of these components right that involves the family saying it's okay we know she could get hurt we're okay with that you know we understand that this, that this is her stage of her disease and having the staff you know have that support of of the doctors and you know we know that she's going to fall you know that she might fall you know, we try our best well when she starts running let's try to distract her let's try to you know soothe her but you know we, we there's a limit to what we can do you know in these scenarios um, and so, so it's it was just a, a very good example of how how do we construct a falls care plan that everybody can stand behind and and not it, when it when possibly the inevitable does happen that they don't feel like they haven't done everything that they can. So yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. Community base, yeah, you know, and so that's an area that I don't, I mean, so I know that there are people who do look at unintended consequences of falls prevention in those environments too, that we can make people over cautious. We can make people stop moving because they're worried, you know, if you give someone a falls prevention session where you just tell them about all the hazards in the world without giving them the confidence to go out and confront them, then you can actually make some things worse. Um, but the, I, I, I think exercise is, there's no, no harm to exercise but you're right the bigger picture is often as important right like if it's just an exercise program but then they go home and they have a cluttered environment and they're tripping over their piles of newspapers then it's not it, yeah it's another story yeah so there's always more than just like what is seen in the um and so so the that's why like you know when they do those like that the the false prevention plan like it's all we do a lot of false risk assessment we do like 
a lot of talking about how much people are at risk, and then we d it does not get carried over into a really effective and and actually implementable falls care plans. And often we leave out that part, what happens after a fall, because it's often a lot of falls planning is how to prevent the fall, but there's this whole other part, what to do when someone does fall. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Like like um the, the nature of the fall, like whether, yeah. There are people who do that kind of work, yeah. <coughs> preventing injuries yeah so that's like a whole so it's really interesting as I had this conversation with someone from Health Canada and they said we kind of regret doing false prevention we think that we we should have done injury prevention because again so like false prevention is a really hard target but injury prevention is a little bit more concrete right which is more like a harm reduction approach right like so if people are falling how do we make sure they don't Get, have injurious falls when they fall. So there are researchers um, who look at the mechanics of falling, and you know what. And there's a, um, the, one in British Columbia, um, Steve Rabinovich, who um, has this amazing project where they watch videos of people falling. They just they have a, a nursing home where they just like watch and watch. They've, they've collected hundreds and hundreds of videos of people falling and recorded what happened and and modeled the fall and you know why is it that this person broke their hip and this person didn't and and those sorts of things and you know why is it that people fall um, and so yeah so they they do do that and I I'm sorry I don't have off the top of my head the data but. Yeah. 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 And it, 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 these these are those kind of turning points for people, and you know we we obviously want to prevent injury and prevent that if we can. Um, um, but once they're in long-term care, I think that the focus has to shift a little bit, that it has to be about their comfort and their quality of life, and I think that's where we're falling down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Stop recording.